God's word, shall we? Exodus 3, 16. Exodus 3, 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 4, 1. And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto you. And the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses fled before it. And the Lord said to Moses, Put forth your hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, and he caught it in a rod in his hand, and they, that they may believe that the Lord God of the fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath appeared unto you. Lord, thank you for your love today. Thank you, God, that you take that which is little in our hand, and you turn it around to be something great. Now, Lord, I pray you minister your grace to us this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Now before you see it, why don't you find a veteran that already stood up, give him a big hug, hug, handshake, and say, God bless you. Thank you for serving our country. Amen. You know, events like this in the Bible always get my mind wondering. I mean, how can a how can a simple stick turn into a snake? And then back into a staff. That's weird. It's things like these that I ponder throughout the day. And not just the snake incident, but some other weird things that keep you wondering. For instance, when a cow laughs, does milk come out of its nose? <laughs> I don't know. And, and this is for all our hunters. How do they get deer to cross at that yellow sign road? Road sign. How do they do that? How about since a fool and his money are soon parted, how did that fool and his money get together in the first place? And why? Why is the abbreviation... It's such a long word. And, and how do you know when it's time to tune your bagpipes? But why is there an expiration date on sour cream containers anyway? It's sour cream. It lasts for 40 years. Well, and what is another word for thesaurus? And why isn't phonetic spelled the way it sounds? And, and, and this one really gets my goat the best of all. It's, what hair color do they put on the driver's license of a mole man? Really? I know these are all goofy questions because they don't make sense and, and they're not supposed to. Likewise, in our text today, God himself seems to be asking a question that doesn't make sense. He says, he says, Moses, what is that in your hand? This brings us to our first point today. It, it seems like it's a strange question. I mean, it's strange because most of us know that God already knew what Moses had in his hand. God knows everything. So why ask something that's so obvious to both God and Moses? I find it very interesting to note that God seems to delight in asking or telling us things about ourselves when he already knows those things. I mean, he called Gideon a mighty warrior. That was news to Gideon. He asked the apostle Saul, who later became Paul, he said, why are you kicking against the goats? 
Throughout the Bible, these strange yet obvious questions were presented to people invoking a response. I can just picture Moses standing there with a staff in his hand and the Lord saying, Moses, what is that in your hand? It's so obvious that it's strange. And here's the principle. God already knows who you are and what you have that will help him fulfill his plan and purpose for your life. I shared last week about the potter molding the clay. God is the potter and we are the clay. And he's already formed us to bring glory to his name. The struggle in life is our ability to yield or not yield to his plan and purpose. Beloved, you already have all the talents and gifts God already needs to bring glory to His name. What we struggle with is yielding those things to the Lord. And why, why does God ask, this Moses, uh, ask Moses a very obvious and somewhat silly question? What is in your hand? Well, God asked this question because there was something about the staff, something that it represented for Moses. You see, the staff symbolized everything Moses owned. He was a shepherd. And his sheep were down on the side of the mountain grazing on what grass they could find. And in truth, they weren't even his sheep. They belonged to his father-in-law, Jethro. Quite literally, it's possible that Moses was something of a hired hand and not even able to claim the flocks under his care. But whatever his financial status, the staff represented the totality of his wealth. A crooked piece of stick was all he could claim to be his very own. Have you ever been in a place where the only thing you own were the clothes on your back? That's a tough place to be in. And it's also the place that we find Moses in this story. He may not have had much, but his staff represented all that he had. And this brings us to our second point. What is in your head? It's not only a strange question, but it's a difficult question. Moses, what is that in your hand? I mean, how would you like God to point out the only thing of value in your life and ask what you're holding on to? Wow. Friends, hear me. Whenever God calls us to a deeper place in Him, He always asks the difficult question of, what are you holding on to? What is it in your life that is yet dedicated to the Lord. Do you have talents, time, treasure that's not surrendered to Him? Are you given to hospitality, have administrative leadership, musical or teaching abilities that are not being used for His glory? Everyone has something that needs to be released to God to complete His work in the world. Moses happened to have a staff. Paul had intelligence. Peter had boldness. Samson had strength. Deborah was a leader. Nehemiah had vision. Rahab had faith. John had love. Daniel had courage. David loved to worship and so did Miriam. Job had patience. Lydia was a maker of fine purple linens. Everyone has something that needs to be released to God to complete his work in the world. And yes, it's a difficult question that we all must answer. God comes and he asks us the obvious. What is in your blank? And we must fill in the blank. What's in your hand? What's in your mind? What's in your feet? What's in your heart? Is that a gift I see in you? Is that a talent that I've given to you? 
Dear hearts, you should know that when we all stand before a holy God in heaven above, we will all be asked this question. The Bible is very clear on this matter. To understand this, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14. Matthew 25 and verse 14. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man going into another country who called his own servants and entrusted his goods to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to one, each according to his own ability, then he went on a journey. <laughs> You see, God gives out talents not according to someone else's ability, but according to your ability. We all don't receive five talents or three talents or two talents or a hundred talents. We all get talents based on our ability, not someone else's ability. Moses had a staff. But that's what God needed to lead one million people out of bondage. Friends, it's not the size of the amount of talents that matters. What matters most is whatever talent is given to the Lord. So in Matthew 25, 16, it says, Immediately, he who received the five talents went and traded with them. And he made another five talents. In like manner, he who got two gained another two. And he who received one went away, dug in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. Don't wait one minute to use God's talent, friend. Go immediately. Don't say, well, once the timing is right, or once I hear from God, then I'll start using my gifts and talents for the Lord. No! Go now! Go immediately. 25, Matthew 19. And after a long time, the Lord of the servants came, and he reconciled accounts with them. He who received five talents came and brought another five, saying, Lord, you delivered me five, and I gained another five besides him. Friends, a day of reckoning is coming. We will all be held in account for how we use our time, our talents, and our treasure here on earth. Matthew 25, 21. The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will set you over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Remember what I said last week about God spinning us on the potter's wheel? God spins us to bring us to a place of joy and the reward for faithfulness is entering the joy of the Lord. When we get to heaven, hallelujah, we're going to have the joy of the Lord for all eternity. Matthew 25, 24. He also said to the one receiving one talent, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. I was afraid. And I went away and I hid your talent in the earth. Behold, you have what is yours. I think this is the most important scripture in this passage. This verse. Because fear is the greatest weapon the enemy deploys to keep us from being used in the work of the Lord. How many times has fear stopped us from exercising our gifts and talents for Him? The words, I can't, has been played over and over in the mouths of people throughout the ends of time and space. Moses said to God, Lord, I can't do it. I don't speak well. These and many other excuses are used by people not to get involved in the kingdom's work. I don't have time. I don't have ability. I don't have any talent. I'm too old. I'm too young. I could never measure up. Did you know that when God called Moses, he was already 80 years old? So much for that excuse. Listen, you need to know, God, He's not after your ability, He's after your availability. Wow. He asked Moses, Moses, what's that in your hand? You see, Moses had already argued with God, but God pointed out that he did have something. He didn't say to Moses, I hear you talk well, or you're a tall man, or you were raised in the king's palace. 
Moses, I haven't chosen you because you're good looking, have lots of muscles, or have jet black wavy hair. Are you kidding me? He simply said, what is in your hand? You know, we get hung up on all the fears of what we don't have, and the devil reminds us of those things daily. But God does not care about those things. He only cares about our willingness to serve him with all our hearts. That's what he cares about. Back to Matthew 25, 6. But the Lord answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. I want you to hear that again. You wicked and slothful servant. He was the master's servant, but he had a problem. The master said, you knew, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter. You should have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received back with interest. Take away therefore the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. Friends, everyone in this house knows that God will require an accounting of how we used our talents and gifts for the Lord. There'll be no excuses in heaven. If you want to be selfish, slothful, and disobedient in this life, then God will have no choice but to send you to hell. Matthew 25, 29. For everyone who has will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who has not, even that which he has will be taken away. Now throw out the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell awaits those who refuse to use their talents and gifts for the Lord. God considers them unprofitable servants with the destiny of darkness and suffering. Now you would think that that verse alone in the Bible would make any person want to get busy using his talents and gifts for the Lord. Unfortunately, unfortunately many don't. They hear the word of the Lord, and they continue living lives that are displeasing to God. Listen, God doesn't send anyone to hell. You choose hell because of your actions. And all that will be based on this one criteria. Jesus says in Matthew 25, 45, then he will answer them, saying, Most surely I tell you, insomuch as you didn't do it to the least of these, you didn't do it to me. <laughs> these will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. God doesn't even care how big your contribution is. What he cares about is your willingness to share whatever you've got in your hand. You know, some have waited their entire lives for the big moment. And all the while, they've missed thousands of opportunities to share in little moments that could have been sharing God's love with others. Okay. Moses didn't have anything big. He didn't have anything of value. A staff. And the willingness to become something great in God's plan to save an entire nation. Jesus did the same in feeding 5,000 with a little boy's lunch of a few fishes and loaves of bread. Little can become much if it's placed in the master's hand. Can I ask you today, what is in your hand? What do you have that you haven't given to God yet? What are you still hanging on to that hasn't been signed over to the Lord? Don't you think it's time to let go of that thing and allow God to use you for His purpose, His plan and will in your life? 
Please allow me to share a story about a young man by the name of James. He had a desire to be the most famous manufacturer and salesman of cheese in the world. He planned on becoming rich and famous by making and selling cheese, and he began with a little buggy pulled by a pony that he had named Patty. After making his cheese, he would load his wagon, and he and Patty would drive down the streets of Chicago trying to sell cheese. As months passed, the young boy began to despair because he was not making any money. In spite of all of his long hours and hard work. So one day he pulled his pony to a stop and he began to talk to him. He said, Patty, there's something wrong. We're not doing it right. I'm afraid we have these things turned around and our priorities are not where they ought to be. Maybe we ought to serve God and place him first in our lives. This young man drove home and made a covenant that for the rest of his life, he would serve God first as God directed him. Many years after this, this young man stood as Sunday school superintendent of North Shore Church in Chicago. And this is what he said, and I quote, I would rather be a layman in the North Shore Church than to head the greatest corporation in America. My first job is serving Jesus. And who is this man? Oh, well, you might know him, so let me give you some hints. Every time you take a bite of Philadelphia cream cheese, you're talking about him. Or you sip a cup of Maxwell House coffee. Or you mix a quart of Kool-Aid. Or you slice up a DiGiorno's pizza. Every time you cook a pot of macaroni and cheese, you're talking about it. Spread some great poupon on your sandwich. I love saying that in church. That's the only time I get to say poop in church. <laughs> How about every time you eat cream out of the middle of an Oreo cookie? You're talking about it. Or serve some stovetop stuffing. Or a thousand other products we enjoy every day. Remember the young man and his pony named Patty and the promise that he had made to serve God as God directed? Do you know his name yet? His name is James L. Kraft of Kraft Foods Corporation. One man who couldn't sell a piece of cheese on his own dedicated his life to God and became the largest distributor of foods in the world. So what's in your hand? Well, it was a strange question. It really was. Moses, what is that in your hand? Duh. It wasn't holding anything else but a staff. But it was a difficult question. Hmm. I wonder what we're going to do with that staff since that's the only thing you have in your life that's of value. And I wonder what you're going to do with that staff, Moses. And that brings us to our third point today, and that is a sacrificial response. You know, there are people who will say, oh, if I were a rich person or retired or win the lottery, then I'm going to give that to God or, or do this or that for the church. There are people who are forever saved. One of these days, I'm going to do something special. But right now, I haven't got enough money or time or resources to make any difference. God says to Moses, what do you have in your hand right now? It wasn't much, but it was Moses' staff. But once Moses gave his staff to God, once he threw it down before the burning bush, then it became... God's staff and not his. We're told in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 20 that once Moses started back to Egypt to lead Israel out of slavery, it says he took the staff of God in his hand. Hallelujah. He came with his own staff, but he 
when he left that mountain, he left with the staff of God in his hands. I pray you see the difference. Started out by being a little object of value, a wood stick. But after a fire encounter with God, it became the staff of God in Moses' hands. May we never forget. We will not find God's purpose and will for our lives if we do not respond sacrificially to Him. The Bible says, I'm not my own. I was bought with a price with the precious blood of Jesus. My time used to be my time, but now it belongs to God. My talent used to be my talent, but now it belongs to God. My treasure used to be my treasure, but now it belongs to God. This crooked staff, which was the only thing that Moses had of God, now belonged to God. And once that humble staff was given to God, he used it to shake an entire empire. For you see, with the staff of God, Moses struck the Nile and it turned into blood. With the staff of God, he stretched it out over the waters of Egypt and it brought a plague of frogs on the land. With the staff of God, he struck the dust of the earth and up from the dust raised a plague of gnats. With the staff of God, he stretched it towards heaven and down came fire and thunder and hail. Hallelujah. With the staff of God, he waved it in the air and a horde of locusts came and invaded the land. With the staff of God, he stretched it out over the Red Sea and the waters parted so that Israel could pass on dry ground. With the staff of God, he struck the water, struck the rock and water poured forth to quench the thirst of the Israelites. And with the staff of God, he held it high in the air and the Israelites prevailed in battle over their enemies. It was no longer a shepherd's staff. Because the Lord Omnipotent had placed in Moses' hand the very power of Almighty God. So what do you have in your hand? What is it that you possess that God needs to build His kingdom? Could it be your talent? Could it be your finances? Your home? Your family, your leisure time? Or might it be your very soul? We must all throw ourselves down at the foot of the cross. We must bow our knee before the maker of heaven and earth. It's only when we let go of ourselves or that thing that we're holding on to that we will find true life and the perfect will of the Father. She would say, Pastor, it isn't much. It's of no value. I'm nothing. <laughs> Your nothing becomes God's something if you just put it in His hand. What's in your hand? Well, it was a strange question. Friend, God already knows what you have and what you don't have. It might not seem like much to you, but it means a lot to the Lord. It's a difficult question. The Lord would ask the same of us. What is that you've got that you're not giving me? You say that you love me, but you're not letting go of the things that keep you from serving me with your whole heart. And these questions demand a sacrificial response. A little thing becomes a big thing if it's totally surrendered to the Lord. Can you make a phone call? Can you visit a shadow? Can you write a letter? Can you reach out in love? Can you hold a baby in the nursery? Can you paint? Can you give a little extra? 
What is that thing that you're holding on to? Will you bow your heads with me? Father, I don't know why it's odd, but you seem to always require more than what we're willing to give. And that makes us uncomfortable. It does me. Lord, sometimes I, I just wrestle with this. If I had more, I'd give more. And I know that's not what you require. You only require God for me to give what you've already given me. But here's the problem with me, God. I want to hold on to those things yet belong to you. I want to hold on to those sins, those attitudes. Well, I know I should let them go, but I don't. No, that's my money, God. I want to hold on to that. I know I should be serving, but, you know, others can do it. that's called sin. He that knows to do right and does it not to that person it is sin. <laughs> and we will all sin before a righteous God. And we will give an account of how we use our time, our talent, and our treasure while we're on earth. And that's not Pastor Ron telling you that to put guilt in your life. That's the word of the Lord speaking to you deeply in the recesses of your heart, saying, I need that. The Holy Spirit is drawing that out of you today. Since your heads are bowed, I want to start first with those of you that have yet to give your heart completely to Jesus. Well, we're not even to material things yet, like staffs or pocketbooks or gifts. And start right at the basic. What about your heart? Have you given your heart to Jesus? Does He own you? Are you still being call the shots? You'd say today, Pastor, I do this church religious thing, but truly, I'm not living for God the way I should. I'm not loving him the way I should, walking with him the way I should. I need to give Jesus my heart, my whole heart. He demands nothing less. His word says we are to love God with all our heart, all our mind, all our strength. Everything that is in us should love God. So if that's you today, you'd say, Pastor, today I'm going to surrender my heart to Jesus. You've fallen away from the Lord. You've backslidden. <laughs> we all go through seasons like that. But today the Lord has spoken to your heart. And you want to say, I want to return. I want to renew my vow to God. I want to surrender my heart to Him. If that's you, slip your hand up. I want to pray for you. Yes, friend. Thank you. Yes. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Thank you for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You can attend church all your life and still miss heaven. At some point, you got to give your heart to Jesus. It's the only way you're going to get to heaven. Just confess the Lord Jesus Christ with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. Anyone else want to join these? Say, Pastor, I want to give my heart to Jesus today. Hallelujah. Thank you, friend. Now, the most difficult question of all. We're going to pray in just a moment. It's one that requires a sacrificial response. I don't know about you, but every time this question would be asked of me, I'd run. I'd run my head towards heaven. I'd run my feet towards the altar. That's the question. Are you giving everything to God? If you have something that's not yielded yet in your life, <laughs> I can tell you right now, my answer is no to that question. 
God's still working on me. I know he is. He's so taught around the clay. But I tell you, I need to surrender more and more and more of me to the Lord Jesus Christ. Since your head's about, you say, Pastor Rob, there's some things in my life that I'm holding on to that I want to let God have. If that's you, just lift your hand up. I want to pray for you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Yes, Jesus. Anyone else want to join me? Say, Pastor, I need to let go of some things. I want to surrender it to God today. That's you. Just lift your hand. Amen. Let's all stand together in his house. Thank you, Jesus. This message will have a profound effect on your life. You will either go out of here with your own staff or you will go out of here with the staff of the Lord. The choice is yours. Moses made the right choice. He left the mountain of God carrying the staff that the Lord had anointed. In and of yourself, you can do nothing, but with the Lord on your side, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. So I want us all to pray this prayer first, a prayer of confession for those who raise their hands for salvation, and then a prayer of dedication. Will you please repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Forgive me, God, of all sin in my life. I repent. I ask you to come into my heart and be my Savior and Lord. Lord, I ask you to help me surrender every area that does not belong to you. I give it to you freely today, God. Forgive me for holding back. Help me, Jesus, walk with you all the days of my life. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for praying that prayer. Tonight's a special night. We've got all church prayer tonight. I'd like you to come back to the house of the Lord. We're going to meet here at 6 o'clock. And we're going to go take some territory for Jesus. You might not know it, but they built a brand new park right in our neighborhood. It's just for us. I'm claiming it, but it's the Harvest Church Park. It's right here at 83rd and all, right off of Butler. 